Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, as we consider your church anniversary, Paul writes, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So for this church anniversary Sunday, I want to preach from the topic, A Serving Church in a Selfish World. Again, I want to talk about a serving church in a selfish world. These are powerful words of encouragement that the Apostle Paul has written to early Christian communities in Galatia. At one point, the Galatians, they fell away from the gospel of grace that the Apostle Paul had preached to them, and they made clear their disloyalty to his authority as an apostle. At one point, Paul even called them foolish. The Galatians, they were rebellious people. But you know, before we can criticize the Galatians, I suppose we should consider the world today. The Galatians became rebellious people, but even today, we are living in rebellious times. People are doing whatever they want to do. They're saying whatever they want to say, and they dare you to do something about it. Or say something about it. We're living in rebellious times. For some people, the church itself used to be accepted without argument to speak to the people on behalf of God and to speak to God on behalf of the people. The voice of the church was paramount to human existence. But in 2019, I dare say that the voice of the church is now not always paid much attention to. It sounds like Charlie Brown's cartoon mom. Wah, 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 wah. People, some people just aren't even hearing the voice of the church anymore. Perhaps it's due to all of the many church commentators. You know church commentators, those people who can find everything wrong with the church. I was reading such article even the other day by a man by the name of Ben. And he wrote this article talking about his experiences of the church. He simply entitled the argument, I'm Tired. Oh. He lists 18 things about the church that he's tired of. Now, I don't have time to share all 18 things, but let me share a few things that Mr. Ben had to say when it comes to what he's tired of about the church. He says, I'm tired of being entertained and not discipled. I'm tired of evangelism and missions not really being the thing that we do. I'm tired of having to wonder if these very senior Christian leaders are even saved. I'm tired of Christian celebrity. I'm tired of 90% of the congregation being not being engaged. I'm tired of being judged. I'm tired of Christianity only being accessible to the intelligent. I'm tired of preaching where it's all about me. Preaching that suggests that Jesus died so that I can have a Ferrari. I'm tired of people thinking that I'm backsliding if I skip a service. I'm tired of legalism. I'm tired of being tired. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't shame Brother Ben for sharing his personal experiences of the church. The fact of the matter is some of us may agree with some of the things that he shared. But you know, commentaries like this hit different when someone insults a serving church. Yeah. Particularly slurs on the black church. Right. Understand that the black church has been the anchor for the black conscious movement. I have the great opportunity to teach at Apex School of Theology, and one of the courses that I've had the, the duty to, to teach is African American church history. 
one of the required readings for that course is a book entitled The Black Church in the African American Experience. In that book, the authors remind readers of the significance of the black church. You see, we want to be sure that the seminarians that sit in these seats understand the value of the churches that they will serve. The school is predominantly black. The book talks about how the civil rights movement was anchored in the black church, organized by activist black ministers and laity, financially supported by black church members. The black church is significant. Even secular civil rights groups like CORE and SNCC, they were influenced by black church culture. In the book, the authors, they talk about how it was the black church which provided an ideological framework through which passive attitudes were transformed into collective consciousness, supportive of collective action. That simply means that because of black church sacrifices, we are drinking water from wells that we did not dig. We're eating fruit from vineyards that we did not plant. We're living in communities that we did not so again, church commentaries hit different when they start talking about serving church. Even this church, Mount Zion Baptist Church, right here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, for 130 years has been a serving church. You look around and you think about the people that you fed in 130 years. You think about the education that has taken place, after-school programming, Thinking about crisis control ministry, every Sunday in the bulletin talks about what they're accepting and what you need to go take down there. Thinking about Mount Zion Baptist Church, paying folks bills, benevolence, funds, and thinking about caring for elders with the senior daycare, even scholarships, and giving to people. All I'm saying is, when you talk about the church, make sure you talk about what the church did for you. of 
of Jesus Christ. I'm selfish when I'm born, but when I get to know Jesus and I become a Christian, then I know that it's more blessed to give than to receive. I'm born and I'm selfish, but the more I get to know Jesus, I don't hold on to the things of this world because I know that I have treasures laid up for me in heaven. Church, we can't stop now because we've got to give them Jesus. Yes, the community needs food. Yes, the community needs clothes. Yes, the community needs so many things. But if we don't give them Jesus, we failed. And so maybe that's why Paul wrote these words because he understood. He had to say, as we have every opportunity, let us do good to all people. Because we probably know how to do good towards ourselves. So Paul says, every opportunity you get. And maybe Paul knew as well that not only are humans innately, innately selfish, but humans get weary. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. We get tired. Yeah. But you know we have to do good anyway. Yes. <laughs> he says, let us not become weary in doing good. In the context of selfishness, it makes it difficult, though, to do good. If we be honest, it can be hard sometimes. I'm misunderstood, but I'm still supposed to do good. I'm mistreated, but do good? I'm scandalized. Do good. Racism and classism, sexism, do good? Ageism, do good. Don't become weary. God makes sure that that sun rises. There's a Cuban proverb that says, when the sun rises, it rises for everyone. God reigns on the just and the unjust. We say we want to be like Jesus. That means that we have to continue to do good. But God, even in this selfish world, I mean, God, uh, humanity, we can just tired. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of us are always uh, doing this tired talking. Tired on Monday. Tired on Tuesday. Tired on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And even on Sunday, I suppose I'll go over there to that church, but I'm just tired. I'm tired of, of the church. I'm tired of the church, but has anyone ever thought that maybe the church is tired of hearing how tired you are of the church? <laughs> Humans talk about even how tired they are of the church. Maybe the church is tired of us. <laughs> what if the church could talk back? I know the church building is an added object. It really can't talk back. But what if the church could talk back? Yeah. We're talking all the time about the church. What if the building could talk? Thanks. 